stand as you are able for the reading of the gospel. From Luke chapter 17, verses 5 through 10. The apostle said to the Lord, Increase our faith. The Lord replied, If you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, Be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Who among you would say to the slave who has just come in from the plowing and tending sheep in the field, Come here at once and take your place at the table? Would you not rather say to him, Prepare supper for me, put on your apron, and serve me while I eat and drink? Later you may eat and drink. Do you thank the slave for doing what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were ordered to do, say, we are worthless slaves. We have done only what we ought to have done. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you, Jay. I have mentioned before that when you are reading the Scriptures that it's sometimes good to get sort of a running start at them. You back up a little bit before the Scripture, you're actually studying to read what went right before. Get the context established, especially in the Gospels. That's helpful also in uh, Paul's writings. But read a little bit before, maybe read a little bit after, just to get it in context. Now, what is going on here is Jesus says to the disciples, even if someone sins against you seven times a day and turns back to you seven times and says, I repent, you must forgive. And saying that to them, their response is, increase our faith. That's just not going to happen. Somebody does me wrong seven times in a row in one day, and they keep saying, oh, I'm sorry about that, and then they do it again. Oh, I'm sorry about that, and they do it seven times. You want us to forgive a person like that? You're going to have to increase our faith because we aren't going to be able to do that. It's just not going to happen. And it's a little bothersome, but it's true. I know if somebody was doing that to me, it would really be a challenge for me to just keep smiling and going, okay, all right, that's fine. I forgive you. I forgive you. Unless maybe they were like two. But even then, it gets tiresome. Increase our faith. So apparently the very thought of forgiving the same person seven times a day was so impossible that it was like asking a tree to uproot itself walk out into the middle of the ocean, sit down and root itself all by itself. That's how impossible what Jesus was asking them to do was. And so how often do we have that same cry? What you're asking is simply impossible. You're going to have to increase my faith. Or are we more likely to just say, that's impossible, I can't do it. And that's the end of the discussion. We are on a regular basis asked by Christ to do impossible things. And so his response to the disciples 2,000 years ago still rings true for us today. He says to us, you don't have to have all of the faith you need you just need to have enough to unlock God's grace. Enough faith to be open so that God's grace can pour into you and give you the strength and the wisdom and the guidance that you need to do what God asks you to do. 
Now, today's scripture is not a recipe for some spectacular, visually amazing special effects display. Okay? This is not a magic spell. Okay, I'll have a little bit of faith and then I'll have trees walking around and doing a... I could go into landscaping business. This would be fabulous. No, it's not. No, that's not the way it works. What Jesus is saying to them is a reminder to them and to us to trust God and then do what needs to be done. There is a world of difference between it can't be done and it must be done. When we start off by saying, well, I, this just can't be done, you have already declared failure. You have already said this isn't going to happen. I, it can't be done. I can't do this. You have absolved yourself of any responsibility or blame for the, what happens because, well, how can you be held accountable for something that simply can't be done? And I think we do this all the time. We may not realize we're doing it, but, well, I, I, I just can't forgive that person what they did to me. I cannot forgive them. I, I, I can't stop lying or cheating or sinning. I, I can't stop. I can't leave this abusive relationship that I'm in. Or I can't drop this really bad addictive habit that I've got that is killing me and destroying my family. I can't end this relationship that is not healthy. But when we begin with, it must be done then we have begun to harness every resource and opportunity to succeed. I must love my neighbor as myself. Oh, it's hard. It's very hard. But I must stop lying and cheating and sinning. I must leave, escape this abusive relationship, this addictive habit, this whatever it is that is killing me and ruining my family and destroying my relationship with God and with other people. When we start with this must be done, then we claim the responsibility as our own. We have a responsibility to see that this takes place. But we also gain the realization, I need help. I can't do this. It must be done, but I can't do it alone. Failure is not an option. Now think about your life. Those times when you have had something, I don't know what it was. Maybe it was planning an event with your family. Maybe it was a project at work. Maybe it was a school thing. But you didn't have the option of quitting. You didn't have the option of just saying, nope, I'm just not going to do it. It must be done. And so you got really clever really fast. You got resourceful. You Every thought, every avenue, every resource got turned towards how can I make this happen? It must be done. This is the part that faith and grace play in our lives. Grace is the loving power of God. Faith is the trust that helps us to accept God's grace. And the things we must do as Christian disciples, quite frankly, are beyond us. And Jesus told us that. I'm going to ask you to do these impossible things, and I will help you. But you have to say yes. You have to say yes. We do not have the, the strength or the desire. I don't want to love everybody. There, there's times when I really don't even want to talk to anybody, much less love them. But God says, that's not good enough. You must do this. And then when I do, I realize, well, he's absolutely right, because when I do do what God wants me to do, my life is so much better. Christ will give us what we need. Now, the Scripture doesn't stop there. 
because Jesus knows us. And so we get the last part of today's scripture to keep us humble. Before we get all puffed up with how good and virtuous we have been, with how Christian we are, and you know we like to do that, Jesus reminds us not to expect special rewards and attention for doing what we ought to have done anyway. Do you expect to get a trophy for breathing? Do you expect a dinner to be held in your honor for uh, telling the truth? Do you expect special recognition as a Christian for doing Christian things? And the correct answer is, of course not. The real answer is, well, sometimes I worked really hard. I expected them to say thank you. And Jesus says, no, that's not why we do these things. This must be done because it's needed not so that you can get recognized. And this is a particular struggle in our culture, and it's not anything new. These participation trophies, you've heard of that. Hey, you showed up, here's a big trophy that's even bigger than your grandfather got 50 years ago when he won first place at the Olympics. But you get this, just because somebody brought you here and you didn't sneak out. Okay. When I was in high school, I was at a, a debate tournament, and I, I was talking to this guy, and he won first place in something, and he kind of went up and, uh, and slouched back, and I said, hey, you just won. He said, yeah, and they gave me this stupid certificate. And I said, but that was first place. He, says, he said, Darren, I've got enough of these back home in my dresser drawer. I could paper my room. This means nothing to me. And I thought, how sad. How sad. Our Christian service should not become something that means nothing to us because we've gotten all these accolades. Accolades have nothing to do with why we are to forgive, why we are to love. If we feel like we need to brag, and sometimes we have that need, we're human. Scripture says, okay, brag about Jesus. Don't brag about yourself. Brag about how wonderful God is and how God has made this difference. How God has worked through you and done these amazing things. And when we do that, we end up getting so blessed. We receive so many benefits not, and we don't do it to get the benefits. We are doing what we are supposed to be doing when we are doing what God wants. Our lives are so much better. Just because we are in tune with God and more in tune with the people around us and in tune with our own hearts. Our lives are so much better. Today is World Communion Sunday. And people all across America, all around Georgetown, around the world are going to celebrate how we are united in one body through faith in Christ. And that is such an important thing and we lose sight of that sometimes. So we have World Communion to remind us. That's why we have the display out front with the bread and, and the candle and everything to be the light of the world. To remember that communion connects us as the body of Christ. You are not just one small voice. It's not just the people in this room. The people in this room have done some amazing things. But it's a little overwhelming when we think, okay, the people in this room are the only people allowed to work on saving the world. I can't. But when you think about the body of Christ which includes the people in this room, but also the people across the street and down the street and all the way around the world. We're all working on this together and it makes us so very strong and it makes a huge difference. In the upper room reading today, a woman talked about how she met a woman they didn't speak the same language, they didn't have the same culture. Their skins were different color, like that matters. 
but they met through a, a prayer convention or something and they began corresponding and they became friends. And one of the women said, you know, my family celebrates communion every Christmas and we'd like to invite you to join us when we have communion. Now, I know you can't come from where you live to where we are, so I'm going to send you communion elements. And then on Christmas Eve, we'll take communion together. And they did this for many years. And then one year, the wafers didn't show up. And the other lady tried to contact her friend, and she found out her friend had died. But she said, we had those years together that we would not have had had it not been for our connection through Christ. Nothing in common, but they both had Christ and they built a friendship on that. And she said, I think she said that her family still celebrates communion and they remember this friend that got this tradition started in their family. That's what we can do for each other. We can help each other to be better people, better Christians. And the reason this is important is right now we are living in the midst of a culture, of a time when there is hatred and there is fear, suspicion and distrust. And so we must claim the power of God's love in a time when so many people are saying there is no love, there is no justice, there is no mercy, there is no peace. We must be forgiving when so many people scream, there is no forgiveness. We come together today in union with people of all nations, cultures, and social classes, and we claim that's more powerful than just saying something. We claim, this is my brother, this is my sister. We don't look anything alike. We don't share a same language, a same culture, but we have Christ, and we are strong together through Christ. And when we realize that and claim that, then miracles will happen. The hungry will be fed. The sick will be healed. The blind will be given sight. The lonely will be comforted. God's grace and God's love will continue to triumph because we must do this. Failure is not an option. And Christ says, let me help you and I will share the sacrament of communion with you to strengthen you. So as we share in the sacrament of communion, I pray that that will do exactly that for you. Strengthen you in your faith. Remind you of the bonds and connections that we have together through the power and love of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.